I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Navigating Private Insurance in Canada. And I think that takes some navigation. I've had experience with it myself. Today we'll be joined by our um, expert person, Suzanne LePage, who's a private health care specialist. Um, Canadians are often uncertain about the role and limits of their private insurance coverage. Let's change that. Suzanne LePage will be providing a discussion of Canada's private drug plan marketplace and its overlap with government-provided services. She'll walk us through what to expect in terms of coverage and answer audience questions about private insurance. You'll see a little box on the right-hand side uh, of your screen. You can type in your questions there as we go. Uh, Suzanne is a private health care strategist with strong pharmaceutical industry, group insurance, and employer relationships. Her pharmaceutical industry experience as national manager of private health care for Roche Canada complements almost 20 years in the group insurance industry. We encourage you to direct any questions you have about Canadian private insurance to our presenter. You can type your questions, as I say, in the window on the right, and our moderator, Jared, will read them out to the presenters at the end of the uh, presentation. For those of you who haven't attended an earlier webinar, this webinar is hosted by the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. At CCSN, we work with patients, survivors, families, partner groups, and sponsors on collaborative action to identify and remove barriers to optional patient care, to ensure access to education and action opportunities, and survivor involvement in healthcare decision making. We also support evidence-based research on ways to promote equal access to early diagnosis, timely treatment, and follow-up care. If you'd like to learn more about CCSN, please visit our website at www.survivornet.ca. This webinar will be available online tomorrow. There will be a full video on YouTube, and the slides will be available in PDF format. Links to both will be sent out by tomorrow afternoon. Now, over to you, Suzanne. Thank you very much for the introduction. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, you're, you're, you're coming through just fine, Suzanne. Okay, great. Thank you. So today I'm talking about navigating private insurance in Canada. And I know we have a broad range of stakeholders that are on the line. But my aim today is focusing on from the patient's perspective because there's many different perspectives that we can talk about when we talk about private insurance. And today I'm hoping to give some information to someone who the patient or works with patients to navigate this coverage. Just apologize, I'm having some technical difficulties at my end. So my overview will be first to tell you a little bit about the unique characteristics of private payers and what makes them a bit different, and uh, tell you a bit about the stakeholders and the type of coverage they provide, some of the cost pressures that uh, private plans are facing, some trends we're seeing and how that's changing the landscape, how to tackle declines and appeals, and then a little bit of a guide to how to inquire about your own private coverage. And I've just tacked in just a little bit about OHIP Plus and private plans because I am getting a lot of questions about that. I'm not an expert in that area, but I can share what I know. And then I have an opportunity for questions and discussion. So Canadian drug expenditures, Kaihai just released their new report. And out of that report, we saw that um, prescription drug costs, 63.6% .6 of those costs are funded by private. And of that private, the breakdown is 62% of that comes from private insurance, and 38% comes out of pocket. So private insurance is a very important part of the Canadian healthcare system as it re relates to funding medications. Um, another recent uh, survey came out uh, from OECD, which showed that with the exception of the United States, Canada is the biggest country where voluntary health insurance or other, uh, other out-of-pocket costs are funded uh, almost as much or more than the, the public insurance. So we are a big player in terms of a private insurance in this country. So let's just talk a little bit about the industry. This information comes from the CLHIA. Um, they fund uh, f almost $41 billion in premiums, and premiums are the amounts that are paid to provide coverage. 80% of working Canadians are protected by private health insurance. And if we look specifically at extended health, $25 million, uh, 25 million Canadians are covered by uh, private plans. In terms of health benefits, uh, the spend for health benefits is $32.5 billion. Specifically, drugs represents 
11 billion of that in addition to some of the other extended health benefit costs. And again, today I'm going to fo focus primarily on drugs because that's people's most uh, usually most important question. But they do offer other benefits, which you can see listed here. So, what are some of the unique characteristics of private payers? Private payers are different. Employers view. Oh, we just had a. Hold the line while I'm there. We go. Employers view drug coverage as part of their compensation package. I'm sorry, I'm having technical difficulties with my screen here. So, uh, it's managed by human resources within the company, not healthcare providers. And the stakeholders that are in the market, such as insurer and benefit plan advisors, I'm going to review some of those in a minute, are all suppliers to the market and also business competitors. And so, it's important to understand that distinction. Insurers are targeting their customer is the plan sponsor, who is often the employer who pays for the benefits. These are confidential, confidential business to business transactions. So the priority relationship is with those customers, which are the plan advisors and the plan sponsors. I think what frustrates many people is that there's a lack of transparency and the fact that there isn't an obligation that the plan or the coverage decisions that they have are shared publicly. One of the main reasons for that is concern about competitors gaining market intelligence. One insurance company may not necessarily want another insurance company to know about them. And although they do communicate some of the information, it's usually confidential, targeted to their specific uh, customers. And if you're a plan member, you usually can access your own coverage information via an insurer call center or secure web portal by providing your plan information directly to them. It's also important to know that employers pay for the health benefits. We often think about the insurers as being the one who pay, but in fact, they pay a premium based on the makeup of their group, so the, the uh, makeup in terms of the, um, the population they cover and the claims experience they've had from previous years. And there's something called pool charges, which is extra risk protection for claims costs that are over a threshold, so for example, $10,000, which provides additional protection called pool charges. But again, when these costs go up, uh, so do, so do, when these claims costs grow, these costs grow. So at the end of the day, the employers are funding the benefits. And that's an important distinction to know as we talk about some of the changes that are happening in the market. So let's review who the stakeholders are, because I'm going to use their names throughout the presentation. In this landscape, the plan sponsor is the organization or stakeholder that uh, decides what the plan coverage is and pays for it. Typically, we think of these as employers, but sometimes we have multi-employer trusts. Sometimes we have unions. Sometimes we have other types of organizations that are the plan sponsor. But by and large, they are employers. They provide the benefits to their plan members, which are often employees, but they can be union members or other or, um, um, stakeholders. And typically, the plan sponsor tries to provide the best coverage possible with the budget that they have in place uh, for benefits. Um, the only province where uh, coverage is, is required or regulated is in Quebec, where there is requirement that a plan uh, sponsor or an employer offer coverage at least as good as the RAMQ coverage. But in every other province, what they offer and how much they offer is really up to the plan sponsor. In some situations, there's a collective bargaining agreement with a union that decides, uh, determines what the coverage will be through collective bargaining. But in other cases, uh, it's left up to the plan sponsor. Because plan sponsors are generally employers and benefits managers or even an accountant in the organization that has a lot of things to do, many of them use benefit plan advisors to help them un um, understand benefits, uh, decide what to cover, determine what the best rate is, et cetera. And these benefit advisors are very similar to your uh, financial planner or your personal insurance broker. And, and they are typically paid by commission by the insurance company. They are selected as the uh, trusted advisor by the plan sponsor to help them navigate this landscape. The uh, plan sponsor and their advisor will choose an insurer to offer their benefit plan to run it, uh, administer it, and pay the claims. And if there's a drug plan, sometimes we see somebody called a pharmacy benefit manager or a PBM that will manage the pay direct drug claims transactions that happen between the pharmacy. So if there's real-time adjudication with a card, 
traditionally speaking, a, a pharmacy benefit manager will handle that on behalf of the insurer. So for example, in Canada, we have TELUS Health, which manages the, P, which is the pharmacy benefit manager for two big insurers, Sun Life and Great West Life. And then we have Express Scripts Canada that manages uh, the claims for groups like Desjardins and or um, um, Manulife. We do have some carriers that are both um, a PBM and an insurer, so they don't subcontract that. And that would be groups like Green Shield and or the Blue Crosses across Canada. Let's talk a little bit about private payer coverage. I think to most people, uh, some people feel it's just really a random decision about whether they pay for the drug or not. But in fact, um, what you'll, you might not know is that this is actually all managed pretty closely through a computer system which is all programmed in advance and it's real-time adjudication. Um, it's important to know that private plans are all different. So some private plans may cover a drug and some may not. The coverage can vary within one insurer. So uh, you can have uh, two different plans with one same insurer and they'll have different coverage. And you may even have different coverage within one employer. So for example, you can have different coverage for the salaried staff and the hourly staff. You could have different coverage based on job level. And you may even have different coverage if someone has flex benefits. So a colleague that has the same job as you but has some options to select coverage may even have different coverage. It's the individual employers that choose the coverage and they decide what they want to cover and how much coverage. And these premiums that they're charged will be based on the actual plan design and their claims. Each insurer offers a wide variety of plans to meet different needs. And some may cover your drug and others may not. And there's also different prices for the different plans. It's important to understand that access is more than, is this drug covered? Because there'll be other features that will impact patient access via their drug plan. And so from examples that we're going to talk about is things like prior authorization, plan maximums, or step therapy. Um, I use this chart to help explain some of the decisions or design options that plan sponsors choose when they decide what kind of benefits to cover. And um, this is meant to show some of the common options. What most people think about when they think about private plans is formularies. And they think about, well, is this drug on the formulary or not? What you can see here is the most common formularies are, that are available with private plans. And I will start on the far right, uh, which is the most generous and very rare. But it's called the prescribed drug plan, where drugs that are prescribed by a doctor, even if they're over the counter, are covered. Some of these existed in the past. I'm not sure if any exist anymore, but they are very generous. Um, I have one here called prescription, uh, an open. It, it's one we call prescription by law, which means if the drug legally requires a prescription, it might be covered. And a lot of people have called that an open plan in the past. But we'll see as we talk through this presentation that there are very few situations anymore where something's completely open. We have plans that are called provincial mimics. So depending on the province you live in, your private plan may choose to mimic or copy the provincial drug plan. So if you live in Ontario, it might mimic ODB. If you live in BC, it can mimic BC Pharmacare. A managed formulary is where the insurance carrier uh, or any third party that's selected by the insurer, the uh, plan sponsor, will make clinical and cost effectiveness decisions, decide which drug to cover. And finally, you may have a situation where we have frozen or custom formularies where maybe it's a healthcare organization that has decided that they're going to decide which drugs are covered and they customize the formulary. So most people stop here and say, well, is it on the formulary, therefore it must be covered or not covered. But most people don't realize is there's a few other decisions or plan design features that determine if a drug is covered or how much is covered. So the first uh, series of, of factors would be the uh, copay amount. So sometimes a plan will have a percentage coinsurance, which is a split between what the plan member will pay and the plan sponsor will pay. Sometimes it's a flat dollar copay. Sometimes we have a deductible. The deductible could be per prescription or per year. We can have a sliding coinsurance, not as common, but what that might be is for the um, uh, the uh, first thousand dollars of claims are paid at eighty percent. And then after uh, after $1,000 out of pocket has been reached, uh, the plan reimburses at 100%. And finally, there might be multi-tiered plans where you might have, for example, 
managed formulary drugs are covered at 100% and all other drugs are covered at 80%. Some other factors that might be built into the plan would be a therapy class inclusion or exclusion, therapy class limit. One of their category might be smoking cessation or vaccines, sometimes things like fertility drugs. So different types of categories where the plan sponsor or the insurer has decided to put a limit on them. Uh, we might have something called trial script, which is not as common, but that might be for a drug that has a high um, likelihood that potentially there'll be adverse effects, might not work with a patient, and therefore they might only allow a small supply to start, and from after that point in time would fill the prescription for the full amount if it works with the patient, and that avoids wastage. And then some plans may have a day supply or a quantity limit. Some plans have, uh, many plans have a, a, a built-in feature which determines what the allowable price is for the drug to ensure that excessive prices aren't submitted to the plan. We may have generic pricing turned on, which means if there's a generic drug, the uh, private plan will only pay up to the generic price, and if the patient would like the brand, they would have to pay the difference. We have annual and lifetime maximums, and then we may have dispensing fee caps. So these are just some of the features that are built into private drug plans that will determine if a drug's covered or not. So an example of this could be is that you might have a situation where the drug may be covered, but because of uh, a maximum built in, the, uh, the actual coverage won't be applicable because the maximum has been used up. So in terms of private drug plan cost pressures, there's two types of cost pressures that are facing private drug plans. The first is the claims cost, which is information that we can um, get statistically through the different pharmacy benefit managers or insurance companies. And what we saw from TELUS Health in 2016 is that the el average eligible amount per cardholder claim was 445, and that was up almost 6% from 2015. However, when we look at specialty drugs, which are the over 10,000 um, annual cost, 26% of the total claims cost came from specialty drugs but yet less than 1% of the actual number of claims. The average annual amount for claimant for specialty drugs was over 18,000 versus non-specialty uh, claimants, which were $509. When it comes to premiums, there's no publicly available um, information about premiums. This information is a confidential negotiation between the insurer, the plan sponsor, and the plan advisor. When we look at market research data that has come out in the previous year, 65% of employers said they experienced a cost increase in their benefit plan. 66 reported that total benefit costs increased over the past three years. And over 80% and of them are concerned about the growing cost will exceed the rate of inflation over the next three to five years. So what we see is that growing costs are a big concern for private drug plans. So what are some trends we're seeing in the private market? and how might they impact patient access. There's a lot of things that are happening. I think the first and foremost is we're seeing the private payers put a very much increased scrutiny on the pipeline and new drug submissions. They want to understand what's coming down the pipes and how those new products may impact their, their claims and their plans, and therefore they're doing a lot more due diligence as it relates to new drugs. Um, we are also seeing that um, some insurance carriers are putting in case management for drug claims, especially in the specialty drug market, and that would relate to um, very similar drugs that might be on a patient support program. They will also uh, have the insurance company doing some case management to assure appropriate use of the drug. Some private plans are using preferred pharmacy networks. Uh, for their specialty drugs, and therefore that may mean that they require uh, that uh, the patients use their specialty drug network in order to be reimbursed, and mainly the reason for that is usually a lower acquisition cost, which is passed through the uh, private plan and the plan sponsor. We're probably seeing more and more increased focus on uh, prior authorization to ensure that patients are getting um, the right drug at the right time and meeting the right criteria. We're also seeing an increased focus of making sure that patients uh, are integrating their coverage with available coverage through the provincial drug plans or patient support programs. We also see a focus sometimes on maximal allowable costs, where that means that 
the drug plan in a certain category of drugs may reference the price of a lower cost drug in the category and reimburse up to that amount and then allow the patient to pay the difference. An example of that would be a biosimilar drug where the, uh, where the biosimilar would be the reference price and if the patient wanted to use the biologic instead, they could pay the difference. Um, some plans have built in step therapy, often in their prior authorization criteria where they would have to try on a, a lower drug, lower cost drug first and then move up to a higher cost drug if they fail on that therapy. We're seeing an increased growth of use of managed formularies in the Canadian market where rather than just covering every drug that comes to the market, there's some clinical and cost effectiveness decision making being made. What's important to note is what we're seeing mostly in the Canadian market, though, is managed formularies are offered on a two-tiered plan. So that means that uh, the managed formulary drugs are reimbursed at a uh, higher reimbursement. And however, all drugs are still reimbursed, but some of them at a lower reimbursement. Um, one of the biggest concerns in the private market is many of the large carriers are moving to what we call the delayed listing mechanism, where they are taking um, some more time than in the past. Normally, um, a drug who would, would come to market, especially a specialty medication, might have been covered immediately or very soon after launch by a private payer. Many of them are implementing a more rigorous review process, and that can delay listings from three to six to nine months uh, when they come to market. Uh, we may also see a bit of growth, a growth in plan maximums, annual or lifetime. But again, it's important to note that how these are sometimes used is uh, what we call new plans or virgin plans, where maybe a plan, a small employer didn't have benefits before, and they decide to implement benefits for the first time. And rather than just providing open coverage to manage the cost at the beginning, sometimes they'll implement a plan that may have a, a lifetime or an annual maximum, let's say, of $10,000. Although we may view that as a limitation, we, must, we should also realize that that coverage is actually more generous than before, which was no coverage. And so we have to make sure that we look at this in the light that maybe that means there's more plans coming to market, it's just that they have limited coverage. And lastly, we see a growth in product listing agreements between private payers and pharmaceutical companies in order to get drugs listed or have specific clinical criteria. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about declines and appeals, but because I just did a whole section on coverage, I'd just like to pause there to see if there's any questions for me about that coverage before we start talking about declines and appeals and navigating your own coverage. Jared, do we have any questions? Currently, no questions. So if everyone can wow. just look to your right, <laughs> uh, there are there's a box that you can input your questions uh, on the right side of your screen. So do that now if you can, okay. but uh, Suzanne, keep on trucking. I'll continue. Okay. So one of the things they get asked for a lot is, well, what can I do if my drug claim is declined? How can I manage an appeal? So the first thing I'll say is, you know, just saying, oh boy, my drug is not covered is usually not sufficient information. The strategies you need are situational because we need to know why the drug wasn't covered in order to figure out what to do. So I've put together a list of potential reasons why a drug's not covered and some suggested approaches for patients. However, each of these would have to be uh, handled on an individual basis, but I would view this as a starting point. So why was your drug not covered? So the reason might be that, well, it's just a new drug. It's still under review, and the DIN is not even in on the system yet. So although Health Canada has approved it, it's still not uh, logged into the system at the care. And so what you need to do is find out when the review will be completed and when the decision will be made and follow up at that point in time. Or you can advocate to speed up the process. Um, if you have a private drug plan that mimics the provincial formulary and the provincial formulary doesn't cover the drug, there's limited amount of things you can do until the drug is listed on the provincial formulary. This means that your plan sponsor has chosen very specifically to only have coverage that mimics the, um, the provincial formulary, and there's very little you can do to get that uh, coverage changed. If you're taking a drug that is part of a class that is excluded or limited on the drug plan, it will require an employer appeal or employer discussion to change the drug plan, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. If the drug plan is a managed formulary, and the formulary manager has reviewed this new drug that you want, you need to take and has decided not to cover, 
um, what you would have to do is try to find out why the formulary manager decided not to cover your drug, find out if it's about clinical or cost effectiveness, and determine what the strategy will be to appeal the decision. And once again, I'll give you some suggestions, but each one of these will be have to handle on a case-by-case -case basis. If a drug plan has specific criteria that the patient must meet, and that might be a diagnosis, prior treatment, step therapy, and the patient or your, so the, yourself or a, a family member does not meet that criteria, you need to find out more about why they decided on that specific criteria, and then determine if that criteria aligns with approved indications or guidelines, and determine if there's a, a, a grounds to appeal that decision. Um, if the drug plan requires that the patient try to access alternate coverage first, so that might be, for example, a special a government program, uh, it's important to get that application in as soon as possible, and then ask potentially for an exception or an opportunity for interim coverage while you're waiting for the application to go through the uh, government program. Finally, um, if a drug is covered but the patient has re reached their individual maximum, uh, the employer would have to change the drug plan or allow for an exception. And then the other thing that you might want to explore is um, catastrophic drug coverage in your specific province. So there's two types of appeals. The first one is uh, medical. And this, again, would be situational, so there's no one-size-fits-all. But it would be based on the specific reason for the patient decline. So we need to know, well, why was the coverage decline? Is it because they don't meet a criteria? Is it because the payer doesn't cover the drug? In this situation, uh, under a medical situation, we look to the physician to build, uh, to put together the appeal to the insurer, to make a case for medical necessity, and explain why the alternate or the covered treatments wouldn't be sufficient for this specific patient. The other type of appeal would be an employer appeal. Again, well, it has to be based on a specific reason. So in this situation, I would suggest that if it's a specific plan chosen by the employer who does not cover this drug, the reason we would approach the employer is they're the ultimate payer of the benefit plan. They choose the coverage, and they would be the ones likely to be able to make a change or make an exception. But in this case, the employee has to make the appeal to their employer. And it requires disclosure of a condition, and not everybody's comfortable telling their employer about their health status. And how you would approach it is developing a business case of why it would be beneficial for the employer to cover the drug that you need. Um, there, there are many times that some this may work, but there are other times where an employer does not feel that they can make an exception. It might be for financial reasons, it might be for legal reasons, it might be for precedent-setting reasons, um, but it is one approach you could take for an appeal. So the last section I have is, or the second last section is about inquiring about drug coverage. So if you're going to be calling an insurance company to find out about your coverage, the first thing you can do is make sure that, um, that you have the information you need. And don't forget to check both your plan and your spouse's plan. So you would need to know um, a co uh, the contract number or the policy number. And then specifically, you'll have a certificate or an identification number. You would want to get a, a copy of the benefits booklet that outlines your employer benefit plan. Depending on the situation you're in, that may be a paper booklet. Some of them are available online. Um, Again, I say here about getting the phone number for the insurance company so you can have a telephone conversation, but some of this information is also available online. When you're going to call to the insurance company, they're likely going to want to know the drug name and potentially the drug identification number, so if you kind of have that ready for them. Because what they're going to do is they're going to key in your policy, your certificate number, and your drug name, and it's going to tell them what kind of coverage you have for that drug. Now, likely uh, where things... Uh, sometimes land is they'd say, well, your drug's not covered. And the thing is, is that, well, that may be the case. What you need to know is why it's not covered so that you can um, potentially uh, uh, navigate your coverage a little bit better. And so you could ask them to explain why this drug is not covered by your plan. You might suggest that, you know, you're not familiar with coverage and uh, can you help them understand and maybe point out in the um, book benefits booklet the terms that explain why the drug's not covered. Now, potentially the person you're speaking to on the phone doesn't have the expertise to explain that through the uh, phone call. So they might have to speak, have you speak to someone else or a supervisor to help you navigate your coverage. Some of the times you may be told, well, you know, maybe you should ask your employer because they decided on the coverage. But you can 
to say that for privacy reasons, I'd, you'd rather not discuss your medical condition and then looking for them to help you understand their coverage. Your coverage, I'm sorry. Now, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about OHIP Plus and private plans. I know we have people from all across Canada, but this is something that's happening soon, and a lot of patients are asking about it. So as part of the 2017 Ontario budget, effective January 1st, Ontarians who are under 25 years old and are covered by OHIP will have access to ODB medications at no charge. Uh, the coverage will be available to everybody. And, um, you know, this is being um, uh, viewed as an opportunity for private plans to save money because it will allow them to shift some costs and expenses to ODB. Uh, in order to maximize savings, uh, we'll see private plans make changes to their coverage for this age, age group, and then this could impact downstream impacts to patient access to medication. Now, we don't know how each plan is going to respond, because remember, each of them are individual to the plan sponsor, and the insurance companies are still figuring out how they're going to navigate this change. So I'm going to tell you what is possible, what might happen, but you'd have to talk to your individual insurer to find out more. Uh, private plans could change in a couple of ways. Um, the least likely, but is possible, is that as a result of this change, they can eliminate all drug coverage for plan members under 25 years old. So they might say, now that they have access through ODB, we don't need to provide coverage anymore. Um, that's unlikely, but a possibility. Um, more than likely, uh, they will eliminate coverage for ODB drugs for plan members because they can access them through the government. And they're going to likely require plan members, and many of them have already started, to apply for EAP coverage before approving private coverage. In terms of transition strategy, the Ontario um, government and insurance carriers to the CLHIA, that's the Canadian Life and Health Insurance Association, have agreed for the first six months to continue covering the, uh, uh, the following drugs without requiring an EAP rejection, and that's antibiotics and anti-infectives, blood thinners, and drugs with low EAP approval rates. And these drugs will continue to be covered until July 1st without having to submit an EAP application and getting them declined. For all the other EAP drugs, these will be handled on an insurer-by-insurer -insurer basis, and um, most of them will probably require an EAP rejection in order to approve the private coverage or continue the private coverage. We don't know which carriers will do this as of January 1st, or maybe they will allow a grace period. And so some of the insurance carriers are still developing their communication plans. Some have released them in the last week or so. And many are developing a custom communication to plan members or patients who are taking an EAP drug, and that would be targeted specifically at that patient telling them what they need to do. So hopefully this overview has given you some information about the private market and how to navigate your coverage. And I've allowed some time for questions and answers. So Jared, I'm hoping people are going to engage and we're going to have a good dialogue. Yeah, me too. Uh, we have uh, one or two questions so far. Um, I'll read out the first one here. This is Amy Pilon, and she asks, how often are these appeals successful? So these are, these are the appeals you discussed earlier um, about coverage. I, I don't have any insight into that because an appeal is a confidential in, in, in a, between an insurer and a doctor and a patient, so I wouldn't have insight into that information, unfortunately. Um, um, you know, individual doctors may be able to tell this or not. Um, I've seen surveys done where they, you know, I would say, and employers asked if they would consider an exception, and depending on the size of the employer and the affordability, I would say about 50-50, but individual hmm. patients, I couldn't answer that, Jared, sorry. Interesting. Um, okay, here's another one. Uh, there, there seem to be quite a few rolling in now. Um, so here we go. New MS drug approved by Health Canada and waiting for it to be put on private formularies, or provincial formularies. What does it mean when a private insurer will not bridge a drug cost while waiting for private insurers to list it? And this is Judith Kaye asking this. So when it says an insurer will bridge, or the, sorry, was it the, will the insurer not bridge until they make a decision? Yeah, what, uh, exactly. Um, what does it mean when a private insurer will not bridge a drug cost while waiting for private insurers to list it? Well, the private insurer won't pay for it because they haven't decided if they're going to pay for it. So they're not going to pay for it while they're deciding. Because if they did pay for it, 
and then decided not to, they'd have to withdraw coverage. And that could be a case for a legal charge or withdrawal of coverage. So um, normally they just don't cover until they've made a decision one right. way or another. Are there circumstances? If, if I misunderstood the question, if the person could clarify, but that's... Um, Judith, we'll, uh, we'll put the call out to you again for uh, for the same question, maybe rephrased a bit. Um, and then here's another question from Donna Ziegler. This is being offered by the CCCN, CCSN. Do they have? Do they know? Oh, this might be just for us. Do they know of any additional avenues to try and get help for a patient who requires a specific drug at a Canada-wide level? Uh, Mona, would you uh, would you be interested in taking this one? Mona, are you there? Um, yes. Sorry, I think Mona has uh, muted her microphone. Uh, we'll come back to that one. Uh, I have uh, I have another question for you here. Um, okay. What percentage of people in the workforce are covered by private insurance? Would you say? Oh, I think we had that at the beginning of from the CLHIA. So let me just pull that slide up here. Sure. Because rather than me trying to remember, eighty percent of the working Canadians are protected by private health insurance plans. Mm, okay. Um, and that represents about twenty-five million Canadians. Okay, I have another question for you. This is just a question from us. Uh, in your experience, what is the biggest misconception about private insurance in Canada? Um, that the insurers fund the claim cost. They are facilitators and managers of the employer's money, but at the end of the day, it's employers that mm. fund insurance plans. Uh, and another question is, how we've sort of noticed that there are circumstances in which antagonistic, uh, antagonistic relationships develop between um, insurers and uh, patients. How can patients avoid those? Um, I guess trying to um, trying to sort of as I said in my in my navigating coverage piece is just saying you know trying to explain like I'm just trying to understand the coverage that I have what what you know trying to sort of say like help me understand rather than challenging or putting in a situation where someone's back's going to be put up but just more saying hey I'm just trying to understand here I don't know what's going on I'm sick I have a sick family member I'm just trying to understand better I think sometimes people go in guns a blazing and say I'm you know I'm gonna go to the media and I'm gonna um, get a lawyer and everything and it just gets everybody sort of adversarial mm -hmm. I think sometimes just trying to say just help me understand sometimes can work better okay great and uh, now Mona has a, an answer for the question previously asked and I'll repeat that question hold on um, so uh, for the CCCN uh, do they know of any additional avenues to try and get help for a patient who requires a specific drug at a Canada-wide level? Um, hold on, Mona. I just want to make sure you're online here. Mona, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, you're good to go. Okay. Yes. Yes. The answer to that is that uh, there's not really a Canada-wide uh, place to go uh, to get help if you've been refused a particular drug unless you are... Uh, one, a prisoner, uh, two, in the military, uh, three, uh, Native people, because those are all uh, drugs plans managed by the federal government. But if you're not within one of those uh, groups, then there's no way you have to go through your uh, provincial agencies for drug approvals. Okay, interesting. Um, so here's another comment from Maureen. Uh, on drive it, uh, sorry, private payer coverage for oncology drugs across country varies by province, but any general trends by regions, would you say, Suzanne? Um, well, yeah, um, I think basically because private and public are so integrated with each other across the country, is you'll see private coverage vary by province depending on what the government covers. So, for example, in BC, we see, generally speaking, better uh, oncology coverage by public, and therefore private has to cover less. And then in the in the Atlantic provinces, it's the reverse. So what you'll see is that private coverage may vary by province, but that's even within the same carrier. It says that they'll they'll ensure there's appropriate um, 
um, integration across the different provinces. I don't know if that answers the questions or, or not, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll skip to another question and we can ask if that, that and maybe the person who asked that can rephrase the question if, uh, if necessary, but uh, here comes another one. Uh, drug access navigators can help with... No, I think that might be just a statement from Amy. Um, yeah. So what percentage, this is Dennis asking this, what percentage uh, do drug insurance companies charge employees to administer their drug programs? Well, that varies by, there's so many factors that go into the cost of a benefit plan. Um, it would be, uh, wouldn't be responsible for me to even suggest what that may be. The individual premium is set up with between the insurer and the plan sponsor, and it's dependent on many factors, including the size of the group, the makeup of the group, the makeup meaning the, the population they insure, where they're located, the type of job. So it's really hard to say, uh, definitively speaking, how much they'll charge for benefit plan. Here comes another question. Uh, how common is it for employers to provide private insurance benefits to retirees as an ongoing benefit? So generally speaking, when I've seen surveys done on this topic over the years, uh, it's usually about 20 to 25 percent of Canadians have access to some kind of retiree coverage. That number is declining over time. So for example, if you retired five or ten years ago, you might have coverage, but now new retirees may not have that coverage. And they're also often, the retirees are often the ones that may have a plan maximum in place. Um, where they may only be covered up to a certain maximum in a year or lifetime. Part of the reason for that is that um, uh, to manage the costs and also because most uh, seniors have access to public coverage as well. Hmm. Kim asks, uh, can you elaborate a bit more about private insurance in the province of Quebec? Okay. Um, I, um, in the province of Quebec, private plans, are required if they are if they offer benefits so they can choose not to offer benefits but if they offer benefits their coverage has to be at least as good as RAMQ coverage it can be better than but it can't be less generous than hmm. here's another question for you um, as an organization sorry uh, Judith asks uh, as an organization representing people who need costly drugs and often do not have private plans and with some private plans delisting some expensive medicines, do you think, sorry, do you see public plans increasing their coverage for drugs? Should we focus on the, uh, should we focus our efforts on governments? I'm not sure I understood the question. So can you just, so they, for people that don't have private coverage. Mm -hmm. And, and with the fact that some private plans are delisting some expensive medicines, do you see public plans increasing I guess maybe do you see a likelihood that public plans would increase their coverage for drugs? And if that's the case, uh, should this organization focus their efforts on governments rather than insurance companies? That's hard for me to say. My expertise is only in private. I don't have a, 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 a the, the, the big 20,000 foot view and my crystal ball isn't working that well today. <laughs> so I don't know if I can answer that that's fair. Uh, effectively. Um, um, I always believe that there should be dialogue with private payers, but um, so no, I wouldn't be able to provide that level of advice, I don't think. All right, I'm just looking now. It looks like we're through most of the questions. Uh, I'll throw it open to the audience one more time. Does anyone have any more questions? You can actually raise your hand um, using the raise hand button. Sorry? Oh, there are some questions. It looks like there are some raised hands. All right, you'll have to use the, uh, the question box on the right to enter those questions in. Sorry, Suzanne, we're just waiting here. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, here's one. Uh, do you know the rationale uh, coverage, sorry, do you know the rationale coverage of limiting dependent children to 20, 20, uh, 26 years old? I guess the... Um, you'd have to ask the Ontario, that's an Ontario government question. Uh, okay. 
Will private payers support an NPP? NPP. Sorry, you cut out there. Will private Sorry. payers what? Support an NPP. MPP. NPP. I don't. I don't know what that is. Non-payer plan. National Pharmacare Program. National Pharmacare Program. Oh, again, I think um, the CLHIA has some position statements on Pharmacare on their website. I don't really want to speak on behalf of them. I think they're looking, generally speaking, into having a, a world in which private and public can coexist, but that's all, all I can say at this point. They have some more pointed statements on their website about Pharmacare. Okay, we are once again at the end of the questions. Um, Mona, do you have any more questions for Suzanne? Um, I'm just checking that we've gone through all of them. One more to look at. Um, the, did we talk about the rationale of limiting dependent children? Yes, see? Yeah. We looked at that. Um, general tends by reason. We looked at that. Okay, I, from my list of questions, I think that we are getting to the end. Yep. Suzanne, is there any wrap? Up that you'd like to uh, see what trends you see coming and uh, uh, what people should be looking out for? Um, I guess the one thing I'll say is uh, the best advocacy is a patient to advocate for themselves. A um, lot of times when I talk to employers, they'll say, I haven't had any complaints. Everything seems to be working fine. And a lot of times I then I'll meet patients of patient groups. I've presented with patient groups or to patients and they'll say, there's so many problems. And I know it's tough and not everybody wants to reveal their condition to their employer, but the employer doesn't know anything's not working well unless you tell them. And so if wherever possible to give pay, um, your story or your family member's story and how that their changes have impacted you is the best way to get them to understand the impact. Those would be my words of wisdom because so many times I hear very different messages from employers than I hear from patient groups. I'm just going to chime in here to say that we have a couple more questions. Um, okay. This one from Judith is, can a private insurer pay for a drug approved by Health Canada but not approved by the province yet? Yes, of course. As soon as the Health Canada approves it, it can be prescribed and it can be paid for by cash or private payers. There is no necessity to wait for government, uh, government funding. Okay, here's another one from Sharon. My private insurance reduce, I reduced my monthly payment dramatically once I had a private pension plan pit, sorry, paid out due to the short life expectancy, due to short life expectancy. Can they legally do this? So I can repeat the question. My private insurance reduced my monthly payment dramatically once I had a private pension plan paid out due to short life expectancy. Can they legally do this? Well, that sounds like a legal question. Um, generally speaking, we do see that when people retire and when they go on pension plan, coverage does reduce. That's a general principle in private insurance because generally speaking, um, uh, the plan, uh, many plans don't offer retiree coverage or that they have access to uh, government programs when they turn age 65. If they feel it's a very specific personal situation where coverage has been changed and they've been discriminated against, I would suggest they talk to a lawyer. Okay. So that's all the questions I see right now. I think I'll hand it over to Mona to wrap that up. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for your, for your time and your excellent information. Okay. Mona, are you there? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you for uh, about a dozen people ask questions, so there's a very high interest in uh, this subject, and uh, I would like to thank Suzanne for her preparation and participation in this webinar. Thank you, Suzanne. It's very much appreciated. Uh, a reminder, this webinar will be available online tomorrow. There'll be full video on YouTube, as well as slides, which will be on our CCSN slide share account. Links to both will be sent out uh, by tomorrow afternoon. This is the last webinar in our 2017 series, and we want to thank everyone who has attended during the year, our amazingly knowledgeable speakers and subject matter experts, and all our webinar sponsors, who include Amgen, Boehringer, Ingel, Boehringer Ingelheim, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Janssen, Leo Pharma, 
Merck, Novartis, and Roche. Uh, it's amazing support from all of you guys, and we appreciate it. We'll be starting our webinar series after the holidays with two webinars in the month of January. On the 11th, so this is your sneak preview, people. On the 11th of January, 2018, the topic will be an update on CAPCA. Now, CAPCA is a very important um, piece of the pharma puzzle in Canada, and it is the Canadian Association of Provincial Cancer Agencies. Um, there will, so they'll, we'll hear an update on what they're up to on January 11th, and on January 25th, we'll be discussing the importance of physician feedback in the HTA process, which is health technology assessment. And that really, uh, most of that is related to the drug approval process and what physicians can do. You can encourage your physicians to do. So I think it's important that we all tune into that one. Um, keep watching our website and on the website you can sign up for our e-letter to make sure you don't miss any other opportunities besides our webinars. We publish a lot of information about participation possibilities for other kinds of webinars from other groups and, and other groups uh, research and uh, things that you can uh, participate in. Thank you for attending, and I hope you have a wonderful holiday, everyone. Thank you.